Well, we are drawing near the end, not all the way to the end. We have one more week after this week in the book of Romans. But I hope that God has been speaking to you by his word and and challenging you and encouraging you. And the big theme that we find in the book of Romans is that the Apostle Paul, for the first 11 chapters, is talking about what we believe. And then chapters 12 through 16, he talks about that, well, then how do we live? The theologians call that orthodoxy, right belief, to orthopraxy, right living. We're talking about this idea of I believe... Therefore, I will. And when you really do believe something, it impacts how you live. I mean, and that, that's, that's true in virtually every aspect of life. And so if you say, okay, as a student or as an employee, if you say, if I believe if I work hard and do my best, I'll get promotions or I'll do well in, in school, therefore, I will study hard. I will show up on time for work. I'll do my work because I, I believe something that moves me to action. That's just, that's just natural thinking. And, 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 that's, and that's reasonable thinking. If, if, you say, if you say, I believe that eating a can of peanuts could kill me, and my esophagus will constrict, I won't be able to breathe if I'm allergic to peanuts, or, or having a bunch of jiffy peanut butter would be dangerous for me, you say, I will stay away from that stuff. And if I think it's going to hurt one of my kids, I'm going to tell people, are there peanuts in there? And I'm going to, I'm going to be watching out for them, because I believe something, it impacts the way I will live. If you believe that practicing whatever you wanted to become good at makes you better at it, then you say, I will work hard. I think of this morning, I was so blessed, uh, two of the young women on the stage here, uh, Faith and Hope, um, when I came to Shoreline, they were, I think they were four and six years old. They were playing violin and singing today. When I came to Shoreline, they were four and six years old. I think from the time they were four and six till now, 11 years later, they've practiced they're singing. They practice their instrument. Why? Because they, they want to be able to offer that to God. And I praise God that they believed that practicing would make them better because they bring those gifts now and offer them to the Lord, and we get blessed by that. If you say this, if you say, I believe there's a God who made us, and that God so loves us that he came into human history to show his love to us in Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas, if you say, I believe that. If you say, I believe that when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he made a way for me to be saved. If you say, I believe that. If you say, I believe that God is love and he offers salvation to every single person who will receive that gift. If you say, I believe that. Then, brace yourself, I will share that with people. I will let others know that God loves them too. If you actually believe it. Now, if a parent said, if a parent said, well, I believe that my child having peanut butter or anything, a peanut product would kill them, and that parent gives their kid peanut butter every third or fourth day and they end up in the hospital, you start to wonder if that either parent doesn't believe it or they don't like their kid. You say, wait, wait, their beliefs aren't lining up. If somebody says, I'm a Christian, and I believe that God left the glory of heaven, he came and was born in a manger, God among us, Emmanuel, he died on the cross, he rose, in. I believe it with all my heart. I believe salvation is found in the name of Jesus. I believe it. Here's my question. What's, what is your I will? That I will declare, I will proclaim, I will share with others that there is a God who loves them too. You can't keep it to yourself. And that's what the Apostle Paul is addressing here in the 15th chapter of the book of Romans. He's addressing this issue of, of sharing this good news of Jesus, of proclaiming it, of declaring it in the world, of living it out in a way that touches others. So today... I'm going to give you two challenges. I'm going to give the challenges right at the beginning of the message. I'm going to circle back to them at the end. At the beginning, they won't totally make sense. But by the end, I think they will make sense to you. Here's my two challenges. Challenge number one today. Look out your window. Look out your window. In your house, in your workplace, look out your window. See the world around you. Right where you are. Look out your window. And here's the second thing. I'm going to challenge you to look in the window, in this particular window up here on this map of the world. Not the whole world, but a certain part of the world. And this box right here is called the 1040 window. Some of you have heard that term. Some of you have never heard that term before. It's north of the equator, 10 degrees and 40 degrees. In this strip of the world is the most unreached people when it comes to Jesus. Some of the greatest poverty in the world is here. Some of the greatest brokenness in the world is here, and there are entire countries in this window of our world, entire countries that where less than 1% of the people in that country have even heard the name of Jesus. That's true. 
One of our guys that was here early setting up and taking care of putting all your squares out for your seats and stuff, I, he was asking me about this and I was telling him, I said, you know, yeah, there's, there's countries where less than 1% of the people have heard the name of Jesus. And he goes, really? And I said, yeah. And he goes, then we got a lot of work to do. And I said, you're right. That's exactly right. That's what the Apostle Paul is addressing. So look with me at Romans chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 14. And what I want you to do is to follow along on your iPad, on your phone, and your Bible. Uh, just follow along uh, in, in Romans 15, beginning in verse 14. And we're going to begin to unfold this message that God wants to speak to our hearts. So Paul writes these words inspired by the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 14. He says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. And I think what the Apostle Paul said about the church in Rome, I would say about all of you that are followers of Jesus, that you are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another and to instruct people who need to know about Jesus. Paul writes this then, he says, yet I have written, yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again. He says, you know, but I'm going to remind you again because the of the grace that God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That's, the, that's the, the lost nations of the world. He's talking about all the nations, all the peoples that didn't know about God. He gave me a priestly duty, Paul says, of proclaiming the gospel of God. That's God's good news, sharing it with the world. I love this. So that the Gentiles, the non-believing nations, might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, that's the heart of God. That's the desire of God. Paul says, that's my heart. That's my desire. And I would say to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, and we always have people at Shoreline, probably here in the courtyard and in the cars online, who are still trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing and say, who is this Jesus and do I, do I want to embrace him? But if you've embraced Jesus and received him, this word is for you. If you say, I believe in Jesus, then you say, I will share Jesus with others. It's just part of what we do. Because Sherry and I raised three boys, and uh, I grew up playing soccer. I love the game of soccer. All three of my boys played soccer. And I have a kind of a lesson from AYSO. AYSO means American Youth Soccer Organization. Some of you may have had kids play in AYSO, but I coached probably over 20 teams over about an 11-year stretch. And these little, these little boys and girls who would you know, come in and, and AYSO, the American Youth Soccer Organization, had one primary rule. And here it is. Everyone plays. Everyone plays. Not just everyone plays. Everyone plays an equal amount of time. And if you're really competitive, you're like, well, why would you do that? Wouldn't you want the best kids to play better so you could crush the other kids? And um, if that's where you're coming from, that's okay, that's all right. But, uh, but you know, at AYSO, every kid got their equal amount of time to play. That was part of the philosophy. They wanted the kids to learn the game, love the game, enjoy playing. And I remember one time this, this, one, this couple came on the first day of practice on one of our teams, and they, they pulled me aside. They said, listen, our son, they said he's kind of indoorsy. They said he's kind of an indoors kid. He's never played on a sports team. He's never played competitive sports. And they said, but we, we want him to get out and play. We want him to make some friends and experience competition. But they said, we'll understand if he doesn't really play very much. We'll understand if he's not very good. And they said, we, we get, I said, oh, no, you don't understand. This is AYSO. He will play as much as every other kid. And they looked a little nervous. <laughs> They're like, oh, are you sure you want to go that route? I said, that's what AYSO is all about. But this kid, who was kind of indoors, he had never played competitive sports, there was inside of him this tiger, this, uh, this, 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 he was ready to be unleashed. He grew to love soccer. And he, so I started him at fullback on, on defense. And the, our, our goalie, his name was Keith, gave all the defenders nicknames. So he could call him quickly and he, he gave them all nicknames. So he says, come here, come here, what's your name? He says, well, he says, my name's Matthew. He says, how do you spell your name? He says, we already got a mat on our team. He says, how do you spell your name? He says, well, M-A-T-T-H. He says, two T's. He says, you're double T. So that's your, that's your name. You're double T when you play soccer. And you can see this kid. He's like, I'm double T. I got a nickname. I, I don't think he'd ever had guys give him a nickname. There's something about when guys, if it's a good nickname. But, if, <laughs> but, but, they, but he's like, he had a nickname. And he, he, was, he was so, he contributed. He was passionate. He, it was like life for him. He fell in love with his sport. He would have never learned that sitting on the sidelines. Why am I telling you a story about AYSO? Because becoming a Christian is the same way. Everyone plays. No one sits on the sideline. And some of you look and say, okay, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I believe the gospel. I, mean, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe he rose again. I believe he offers salvation to all who will believe. I'm just not the kind of person that shares that with anybody else. Guess what? 
Only about 3% of Christians are evangelists, but 100% of Christians are called to play. You're called to be on the field. And there are people around you, in your school, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, people you interact with online, that need to know Jesus, and you're the person God has put there. And some of you are like, I'm kind of indoorsy, I'm kind of I'm quieter. I, you know, sharing faith is for like those Christians who are like, you know, wah! Kind of, you know, those, you know, those, they're, wah! They're, they just meet, they meet, so hi, I'm so-and-so, let me tell you about Jesus. And it's like, that's, I'm not that. Most people aren't. But if you're a Christian, you believe in the good news, you've met Jesus, and you have a calling. And that's what the Apostle Paul is addressing here. He's wanting every Christian to understand. And here's my prayer today, that every single one of us will take one step forward in sharing about Jesus. I don't know what your step is, but I believe before this morning is done, the Holy Spirit's gonna speak to your heart and put on your heart, this is your next step. Take that step and you watch what God does. Because like double T, there's a tiger inside of you and there's something that God can use you to do that it will make an eternal difference. And, and so we're gonna think about that and look what the Apostle Paul teaches about it. So, the Apostle Paul is clear about this, that God has prepared you to do the work he's called you to do, so be confident. You can be confident. In verse 14 of Romans 15, Paul writes this, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with the knowledge and competent to instruct one another. You're filled with goodness, filled with knowledge, and you're competent to instruct others. Why is he saying that? Because many of them didn't see themselves as having anything to offer. But he said, God has something he's put in you because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So here's a question for you today. Do you see yourself as a proclaimer of God's good news? If you're a Christian, do you see yourself, and when you look in the mirror, you say, that right there is a proclaimer of God's good news. Now, I ask you if you see yourself that way because I know how God sees you. He sees you that way. He says, I put my goodness, my faithfulness in you, my word in you. God has called you. God has equipped you. You can be more. Double T didn't know he was double T until somebody named him. He didn't know what was in him until he got on the field. And too many Christians have been sitting on the sidelines for too long. And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, God has put something in you. Get out there. Try. Take your step. And if you take a step this next week towards sharing your faith in some way, you will be amazed at what God can do in you and through you and the passion he can grow in you. And I want to be clear that when we talk about this, this idea of saying, I will proclaim Jesus, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a preacher. It doesn't mean you're going to stand on a soapbox and tell people they're going to hell. That's not what it's about. It's about living your life for Jesus openly, naturally, and letting the good news come through you in lots of different ways. So somebody is watching you over time, and they notice something about you. They notice that you don't gossip. When people in the workplace or people at school start talking about others, you don't join in. They notice that because, because the Bible actually says that's sin and you shouldn't be doing it, but you don't do it. So they say to you, yeah, it's kind of, whenever we get talking about stuff, you don't join in, the, join in the conversation. That's when you get to proclaim. So, you know, actually, um, I actually don't, I don't take part in that. Well, why? Because I, I'm a follower of Jesus and every single human being is valuable to him and loved by him. And so I don't take part in talking to other people when they're not there and in the same way I wouldn't want them to talk. And you, just, and you begin to talk about how your faith guides who you are. That becomes part of your witness, that part of your proclamation that Christ has transformed you. Somebody watches you go through a difficult time. You, you lose a loved one. You go through a time of loss or a time of pain. They watch you and they see a strength in you. Not that you don't struggle, not that you're, it's easy, but they see a strength in you. And they say, man, you really seem to have strength when you go through hard times. Where's that come from? That's when you proclaim. Well, God's word fills me. And God's spirit guides me. And you talk about how Jesus is with you. And you begin to share the story of how Jesus changed your life and carries you through those painful times. And they begin to wonder, maybe Jesus would love me enough to fill my life and carry me through the hard times, which is exactly what Jesus wants to do. People watch you and they, they see this hope in you. And does our world need a little bit of hope right now? Oh, man, probably as much as ever. And they, people watch you in this crazy time where there's so many struggles and people are feeling hopeless. And they see in you there's this resiliency and this hope. And they say, what is that? And that's when you proclaim. Matter of fact, Peter, the apostle Peter, said always be prepared to give an account, to explain the hope that you have. And he says this, do it with gentleness and respect, but do it. Talk about the hope you have in Jesus. That's your proclaiming. And may, sometimes it's when somebody asks a question about Jesus and you say, here's what I believe. He was God who came among us. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again. I've received his grace. You tell your story, his story. That's part of it, but it's also just sharing how he's transforming your life. I hope and pray that you take your next step in sharing who Jesus is to you. 
And then as you continue on in, in Romans 15, we learn that God has a mission for you, and it's a really big mission. I mean, God has a mission for us. It's a massive mission. I think of it, how many of you grew up watching the TV show, Mission Impossible? Anybody remember that TV show, Mission Impossible? Okay. How many of you saw the, any of the movies, Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise? Movies? Okay. Now, here's the funny thing about all the TV shows, every episode, and every one of the movies. The mission is impossible, but every single show, the mission gets accomplished. Did you ever notice that? I mean, it's impossible, but at the end, I never watch a show where they're like, this one didn't work out. You look at the call that Jesus has to reach the whole world with his love, and you go, man, that's too big. But in the power of God, it's being accomplished day by day and moment by moment. And so enter into that. Even if it's a big, just that God's given us a big mission to help reach the whole world with his love. Romans 15, 16 says this. Paul writes, he, God, gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God, that good news of God, so that the Gentiles, the lost nations, might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, that's God's goal. That's God's mission. All the nations of the world would be filled with God's presence and saved by the grace of Jesus. That's a big mission. Would you agree? That's a huge mission. But that's the mission that we're on, and we continue pressing into it. And the apostle Paul, when he walked into that mission, he knew there were all kinds of obstacles. The apostle Paul knew that this could mean rejection by his own people, and it did mean rejection by his own people. He knew it could mean rejection by those that weren't his own people, and that's what it meant. Paul knew that it could mean physical beatings. In the ancient world, they discovered that if they, if they strung someone up and scourged them, used this cat of nine tails, and they whipped him 40 times, they would kill him. So they would do it 39 times and take him within, within the edge of their life. That was done to the apostle Paul five times. He had 195 scars on his body for preaching Jesus. Was there a risk involved? Yes. And can I tell you something? If, if somebody told you along the way that becoming a Christian means that now that you're a Christian, everything goes your way, everything's easy, you'll never struggle again, you'll never have a problem, and all of life will be smooth sailing. If somebody told you that's the Christian faith, they lied to you. They were preaching out of some book other than this book. Because you know what my Savior said when he walked on this earth? He said, if you want to follow me, just do this. Deny yourself every day, take up your cross, be ready to die, and follow me. That doesn't sound easy. But that's the call. So here's the question. Will it cost you something if you decide I will proclaim and share my faith? Will it cost you something? Here's my answer. Yes, every single time. It will cost you something. But, the, but what God brings through it is glorious and eternal. And it's worth the cost. It's worth the risk. I praise God that he put people in my life who counted the cost and were willing to, to take risks to share the love of Jesus with me. Here's the question. Is your heart big enough for the whole world? I mean, God's vision is for all the nations of the world to come to know him through faith in Jesus Christ. Say, God, make my heart bigger. Give me a bigger heart for the world. Give me the heart of Jesus for this world. And then on top of this, the apostle Paul says, you have a message, and your message that you're gonna proclaim is good news. It's not bad news. It's the best news possible. Romans 15, 16 again. It says, he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. That word gospel means the good news. Do you know that the message Christians have for the world is the best news possible? What we're saying to people is this. There is a God who made you, and that God knows everything about you, and he loves you like crazy. That's good news. God knows everything about you, and he loves you. The good news is that God left the glory of heaven came to this world with no sin, died on a cross for our sins in our place and offers us forgiveness. He offers us eternity with him. He offers us cleansing from all of our wrongs. That's good news. If you've got the idea that the message of the Christian faith is bad news, let me just try to put, put this in clear words. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Is that clear enough? Uh, one of our board members, Doug, is that clear? Yeah, if you got the idea that our news that we bring is bad news, that's a lie from the pit of hell. It is good news that God knows us. It is good news that God loves us. The one who made us loves us. It is good news that he sent Jesus Christ. So understand, if you, if you say, God, I'm gonna take my next step out in proclaiming and sharing Jesus. I'm bringing the best news possible in a hopeless world, the best hope that anyone can hear. So here's a question for you. If you have an opportunity can you articulate the simple message of the gospel? 
Do you know how to put in words, in your own words, in your own way, out of your personality, the simple message of the gospel? I've spent the last 40 years of my life trying to figure out how to help people share the simple story of Jesus in the easiest way possible. The best I've come up with is eight words. I think you can share the whole gospel. If you can remember eight words, you can know how to share the gospel. Here's the eight words, okay? God's love, our problem, God's solution, our response. That's the whole gospel. God loves us. He knows us. He loves us. Our problem, we've sinned. We've separated from God, and we can't find our way back to him. God's solution, Jesus Christ came, lived, died, rose again, and paid the price for our sins and offers us forgiveness. Our response to receive that gift. I've shared with you my journey with my dad, and those of you that have been part of Shoreline for the last 11 years have prayed with me for my dad for 11 years, and I have other friends that have been praying for 36 years uh, for, my, for my dad since... Uh, uh, I, I thought I've been married 36 years. You've been praying with me, but I've been praying for my dad for 40 years. And, and I want to just, just share with you a little bit of that journey because uh, on October 5th, Monday, October 5th, just this last October, we knew my dad was struggling with, with cancer and sickness and he was going through radiation and chemo and Sherry and I got on a plane and went out to see him and prayed for a chance to share the gospel one more time. And we sat with my dad and, and I just said, Dad, I, we've had this conversation many times and we have through the years. And he knows the story of Jesus. But I said, Dad, I want to just share. And I said, Dad, you know, I've been trying to figure out how to help people share their faith naturally in a way that doesn't freak people out and freak themselves out, but it really helps people know who Jesus is. And, and I said, I, I shared this eight words with my dad. And I said, Dad, you know, there's a God who loves you, you know, that God loves you. And I said, you know, our problem, there's sin and we're separate from God. And, and, and that God's solution, I talked about Jesus coming, living, dying, rising again. And I said, but Dad, this last part, our response, you've never responded to receive Jesus. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, um, you know, is there anything that would keep you right now from receiving this gift of God's forgiveness in Jesus? And my dad's response was, nothing I could think of. And we never got to that. We never, I mean, I'd had this conversation so many times over 40 years, and it was always a wall, always a pushback. And so I kind of looked at Sherry, and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I said, well, Dad, are you, are you ready? Would you want to right now pray and confess your sins and receive Jesus Christ? And he said, Absolutely. We'd never been, and so I actually, I just said, Dad, I want to be really clear what we're talking about here. And I walked through it one more time. I was like, okay, God, I want, you know, Dad, I want to be clear. We're talking, I said, are you ready to confess your sins and receive Jesus? He said, absolutely. And I prayed with my dad, and Sherry prayed with my dad, and my dad became my brother in Christ, became part of God's family in that moment. And, that, and that's about, a, what is that, October 5th. So yeah, praise God, right? Um, and I've shared that with some of you have heard that, some of you hadn't, but just that, that's been like the prayer of my heart since the day I became a Christian about 40 years ago. And then about, about a month, a little more than a month later, uh, and, and over that next month, my sister Lisa, who's just a great committed Christian, went to visit my dad every single day. She called all of his kids in Texas and said, hey, what are your favorite Bible passages? I'm gonna go to dad's place that he's living in every day and read the Bible to him and pray with him. So she was praying with him every day. My dad had about a month where every day he got to hear the word of God and pray with, pray with his, his daughter, my sister. And then after about a month after he became a Christian, we got a, a call from my two sisters that were near my dad and said, dad's not doing well. And we need to get a Zoom call with a video conference with all of us kids. So we got all five of the Harney kids, me and my three sisters and my brother, Jason. And we got on with my dad and we shared our words of love with him and encouragement. He, he, he raised us all to be atheists. All five of us kids became Christians. Three of us are in ministry of different sorts. So we all shared our love for Jesus and shared with him. And about two o'clock the next morning, we got a note from our sister saying, dad's with Jesus. And part of me, it's a strange feeling because part of me is sad but for 40 years, when I thought about the day that my dad would die, it was always with this fear that he wouldn't know Jesus. So the fact that he put his faith in Jesus, had a month, he got to walk with Jesus for a month on this earth. He will walk with Jesus forever through eternity. And I will do all I can to introduce you to him in heaven someday because we're gonna be together for glory. I believe that with all my heart. If you asked me, all the times you prayed and said, okay, how do I share with my dad? And how do, I, how do I try to proclaim Jesus and share a story with my dad? And if you say, do you regret any of those moments? Never. Do you regret one minute you prayed for your dad? Never. God wants you to take that next step into saying, not only do I believe that Christ is Savior, but I believe that I'm called to share his love with others. And so I thank you for your prayers and your encouragement. And now um, I've got a meeting at one o'clock today. So in about... Uh, an hour and five minutes with my siblings to plan a celebration of life for my dad and kind of walk through that with, as a family. But I thank you for your prayers. But I need to tell you, 
though I will miss my dad on this earth, the fact that he believes in Jesus Christ, that he's with, that I, I, I can picture Jesus as the good shepherd coming and like a lost sheep picking my dad up and taking him home to glory. And I have that, that, my conviction of that, my confidence of that is greater than any other confidence I have in the world. I know who Jesus is. I know what he's promised. And my dad put his faith in Jesus. Who do you have in your life that you maybe have gotten weary of praying for? I prayed for 40 years. Who do you have in your life that you need to take that next step to pray for, to, to reach out to, to share with, to serve, but to share some, some way to share the goodness of who Jesus is? Let God stir your heart. And then the Apostle Paul continues on. And he says there's hope for radical transformation. And this is what we have to see, that, that God wants to not just, not just kind of have us talk about Jesus, that lives will be radically transformed. Romans 15, 16 again. It says he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so the Gentiles might become, listen to this, an ex offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The vision is this, is that, that lives would be transformed for eternity in this life and forever. And I can tell you story after story after story of people I've watched who've been transformed by the grace of God. I can start with my own family. I can start with friends. I can start with people I know that have come to know Jesus. But, but to understand that God wants to radically transform life. So here's a question for you. Have you seen lives transformed? Have you watched and seen how the Spirit of God can transform a life when someone puts their faith in Jesus Christ? Now here's the invitation. Two invitations. I started here. I want to finish here. Look out your window and look in the window. Look out your window. The Apostle Paul talks about reaching people right where they are, but he also talks about reaching people who are far away. Listen to these words in Romans 15, 17. Paul says, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and by what I've done, by my words and my actions, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. And then he just, Paul goes on to say, I've, I've preached Jesus right where I am, right here in Jerusalem. But look at verse 20 of Romans 15. He says, It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. He says, I want to preach right in Jerusalem, right where I live, right in my hometown, but I want to bring Jesus to where he hasn't been known. Here's my invitation to you. Here's the first one. Look out the window. Look out the window of your car as you drive around. Look out the window of your home. Look out the window of your cubicle. Maybe the window becomes your, your, your computer screen where you're looking at it and you see, other, that's where you interact with people. Some people you may not see face to face, but that's the window that you see them through. Who are the people that are right around you? What can you do to take a next step forward in sharing Jesus with other people? And there's a lot of things we can do. I'll give you a couple of practical things. Here's one. We have a two-week class coming up on Wednesday nights online. You can go on their website and, and sign up for this class. It's called Joy to the World. It's, it's taught by the leader of, I think, one of the, the top outreach training programs in the world, and also the guy who's been the example and the model leader of that in local churches. It happens to be two pastors from Shoreline Church. Walt, Walt Bennett, who leads Organic Outreach International, and Tom Green, who's part of that team and also has led the outreach here at Shoreline for about a decade. And they do a two-time, a two two-week class that just gives you tools for how to share the joy of Jesus at Christmas time. So if you're going to interact with family face-to-face -face or online, you say, I don't know my next step. How do I step into sharing my faith? Take, be part of that class. Just go online, and after the class happens online, we'll just put it out there. And we, I think we take every class to make it available on demand anytime. And get equipped to share your faith. That could be your next step. Here's another way you could take, some of you want to take this step. Some of the women can take this step. And this is one that's just for the women. Uh, we, our, our women's ministry made 300 of these boxes. We always have this amazing outreach event where we share the gospel at a big dinner here. Guess what we're not doing this year is a big dinner on campus. So the women's ministry made 300 of these boxes. And they've got like a candle in it. They've got like a little crisp, like a, like a kitchen towel. They, you can go online and see all the stuff that's in, in these things. But in the box is also a book by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christmas. And in the box is also a video link to a presentation of the gospel that my wife Sherry did that is so beautiful and so winsome that anybody who hears it would, would be able to say, I may not believe yet, but I totally get the message of Jesus in a way that's non-offensive. All that's in this box. And if you, and we've already, somebody told me today there's 300 of them, 156 are gone already. But if you pray women, if you pray about one or two women you know and love that you want to share the true meaning of Christmas with, 
Go online. I think they cost us like 30 to make. I think we're doing it for like 16 bucks to recoup some of the cost. But then you then give it to somebody as a gift for Christmas, early in Christmas, so that they can watch the video, read the book, and you can have conversations with them about it. That might be your next step going forward in, in sharing Jesus and being a witness to him. On our church website, you can go into our outreach department, which, which Pastor David, who prayed today, leads. You can go to the outreach department, and you can click on there, learn more about the good neighbor. And there's six steps you can walk through to help you reach out. Just look out your window right in your neighborhood and reach out there and all that stuff. So I just checked it this morning. It's all online there. It's all there. There's videos. There's training. There's different ideas. If you're like, I don't know what my next step is, go online. Here's what I'm trying to say. This is AYSO, people. Everyone plays. No one sits on the sideline. Nobody. And some of you, there's, some of you, there's a tiger in you. You, you. Some of you are double T and you don't know it. So you, you need your nickname, but you got to say, man, I, I just, I'm, I'm not, I don't talk about my faith. Take that step. Count the cost. Pray about it. Jump into that class. Learn about being a good neighbor. Give it one of these boxes and then, and then meet with a friend online and talk about what they thought about the message that Sherry said or the book that they read, by little book by Lee Strobel. But take that next step. Look out your window right where you live and share the gospel. But here's the second challenge. Look in the window, the 1040 window. There's a place, there's a part of our world that most of us don't spend a whole lot of time in and maybe don't even think about much. But there's a part of our world where the gospel has been scattered, but a lot of people haven't responded. There's places where, where there's a huge resistance to Jesus. There's the Apostle Paul, he says, he says I, I, I've always, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. Paul said there's places where people don't know about Jesus, and his heart broke for those people. Here's what we're going to do as a church. And this may sound crazy to you because right now we're in the middle of COVID and there's all kinds of challenges. There's financial struggles. Is this the time you get a new vision to reach the world? Yes, it's exactly the right time because the gospel is still needed all over the world. So in 2021, next year, 2022 and 2023, Pastor David and his team are gonna lead us through a journey of finding a place in the 1040 window with incredible need for Jesus. And we're going to establish a partnership with World Mission, who's one of our partners already. They have representatives over this part of the world. And we're going to find a, a partnership. And we're going to send solar-powered uh, audio Bibles. Because a lot of those people are, are not literate. They're not reading people. They, they learn by listening. And so we're going to be sending solar-powered audio Bibles in the language of those people. We're going to talk about doing things like maybe a water project where we can show the hands and care of Jesus while we're seeking to bring the living water of Jesus. We're going to do organic outreach training there with leaders to help church leaders in that area. We may send some teams over there to partner with them. We're going to pray in a focused way. And we're going to have regular reports about what's happening in this part of the world and where God's called us to minister. And so I want you to be praying for that. And praying, God, show us the place that Shoreline's going to partner. And you say, again, you say, well, is this the right time to establish a new ministry and a new partnership? I believe it is. And if I'm sharing this right now, and if you're online, in one of the cars, or in the, in the court, you're like, man, that sounds exciting. That just might, might, like, you just feel your heart starting to race, like, that's going to be amazing. You know, where, where, I, I, one guy come up here to take a picture of this and said, I wonder where it is that God's going to send us to serve. I wonder where that place is going to be, because we we're not sure. David's been praying and looking at it, talking with World Mission, but, but if you're, your heart's starting to race about that, will you contact Pastor David or Christy, who is our administrative person in our outreach department, and just say, hey, I want to be on the ground level, on a team of people that's going to be together, figuring out where we're going to go, what we're going to do, and what the next three years are going to look like. And you're all going to get a chance to hopefully give, you know, one, you know, maybe every family can give one solar-powered audio Bible. Maybe we can all be part of a water project. But we want to say, God, we want to, look, we want to look out our window, right where we are, out the window of our computer, in our home, in our workplace, in our school, whatever it is, and say, who's right near me? And God, I want to take my next step. But we're also going to look as a congregation into the 1040 window. In this radically broken part of the world where there's huge poverty and, and deep struggles, and a lack of the gospel. And we're going to say, how can Shoreline Church, of all of us together, look into that place and invest for the glory of Jesus? God, this is our prayer today. That we would have the courage to look out our window and see the needs around us wherever we go and respond by proclaiming, sharing the love of Jesus. And we pray that together as a church, we will look into this 1040 window and that you will lead us to the right place where over a number of years we can partner and build a relationship and walk alongside the planting of new churches and the drilling of wells and the, and the bringing of the word of God and maybe raising up pastors and training pastors and even coming in and praying and then going and being in a partnership in that new part of the world that you're calling us as a church to, to seek your leading, to know where you're calling us. So Lord, fill us with your spirit. 
Give us courage. And I pray especially for those folks who, who have become comfortable on the sidelines, not realizing that they're playing AYSO Christianity and that everyone plays. We just stir our hearts and open our mouths and move our hands and let us look out the window of where we are right now and look into the places of greatest need and let us take action for the glory of Jesus and may heaven and earth be different because we did. We pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. amen. Hey, for those of you that are at home, uh, if you are new to Shoreline, will you please uh, respond by texting the word welcome to the number you see on your screen right now and we'll send you a digital connection card and we'll get to know you. And if you're new to Shoreline here in the courtyard or in your car and you want to go back to, it's just very hard to find, there's a booth back there with giant balloons, blue and silver balloons hanging on it and Patty's back there, she'll be waving and welcoming you. If you're new, go back there. She wants to give you a gift. Thank you for coming, answering your questions about Shoreline Church. And then if you need prayer, Maybe God's stirring your heart. Maybe there's a need in your family, a need in your own life, or maybe just you're desiring to have a greater passion for the world. Uh, you can go right up there and Pastor Dennis will wave at you there at the top of the stairs right over here. We have a prayer team. If you're in the courtyard or in your car, you want to join for prayer, you can head right there. Or if you're online for prayer, uh, you can respond to the address that you see on the screen there, or it, you, and, and then we'll respond to you in prayer that way. But I want to invite you now as we close our service together. And after I send you off with a word of blessing, if you're in the courtyard, will you just uh, get your mask back on and then our team will come and dismiss you. And we're going to keep following all the guidelines because we get to keep meeting. And this is really good. I love, I love our congregation at home, but I love having people actually here. I love talking to... It's, I don't mind staring at a camera, but I'd rather look at your faces. And so this is great. So let's follow the guidelines so we can keep doing this. So right now at home, in your cars... And on the campus here, just open your heart to receive this word of blessing. As we close our time together, may you understand that what you believe, that there's a God who loves us, that he made a way for us to come home to him, that Jesus truly lived, died, and rose again and paid the price for our sins, that your belief in that would grow deeper than it's ever been before. You would say, I believe in Jesus. But may your I will grow also, that you will love others, speak words of grace, and every chance you get, proclaim the good news of Jesus in word and deed for his glory, for the sake of the world, and to get you on the field, finding the joy of serving Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here next Sunday where we have week 12, our final week in the book of Romans. Then we kick off a Christmas series. So God bless you. Have a great week. This is a clip from the latest episode of our Shoreline Conversations podcast. Stick around to the end to find out how to listen or watch the full episode. You can't pick up hate. You can't hang on to hate and hang on at the cross at the same time. Right. You have to lay one down. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a lot of us, I'm not trying to get overly political, but yeah. what we've seen is a lot of hate mm -hmm. and we're picking that hate up and trying to balance the cross and the hate at the same. And you can't, yeah. it can't be done. And it looks awful when you try to do yeah. it. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so I think when you try to do something like that before long, it's like you miss the point before yeah. long, you, you forget who you were called to be and you forget who it is to really, really follow Jesus. And you've heard this, you've grown up probably in the church or yeah. have you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but it's like Jesus, like he literally left with only 11 people. He didn't do well with all 12, right? Yeah. It's like crowds would follow him and loved him, but they would be turned away all the time. Yeah. And it's, can you imagine if just a percentage of people here at Shoreline would say, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to hate. I'm going to be responsible to the calling and yeah. whatever it is that God calls me. And I'm going to pick up my cross. Yeah. Picking up my cross means laying down my agenda, yeah. laying down my political agenda, laying down it all yeah. and, and pursuing who Jesus is. You can find the full episode on our website, YouTube channel, or any major app or platform that hosts podcasts. Just search for Shoreline Conversations and be sure to let us know what you think with a review and subscribe. 